Um, today we're going to hear from Dr. Michael Diamick. Dr. Diamick is an assistant professor of biology at Delphi University, where he has worked since 2015. He was formerly a research instructor at the School of Medicine, Stony Brook University, and a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Geology and Geography at Georgia Southern University. Originally from New York, he received his Bachelor's of Arts in Biology from Boston University and went on to receive a Master's and PhD from the University of Michigan. He is an expert in dinosaur anatomy, growth, and evolution, and has published nearly 30 research articles. His field of research centers on the Bighorn Basin, where he has led fossil exca excavations for over a decade. Dr. Diamick has traveled to museums around the world for research and participated in excavations in Utah, Arizona, New York, and Madagascar. The title of Dr. Diamick's talk is How Fast Did Dinosaurs Grow Up? Please give Michael Diamick a warm welcome. Okay, can you hear me okay? That's good. Um, so thanks, Corey, for that warm welcome, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm out here doing research in the Bighorn Basin, which I've been doing since the start of my academic career in 2006 or so. Um, I've run excavations near Powell, near Lovell, Bridger, down in Thermopolis, kind of bounced around. But to me, this is the most fun and most rewarding place to dig in the world. So um, I just keep starting new projects here. Uh, one of those I've been working on um, with a bunch of students. Students, raise your hands. Okay, students from all over uh, the country are joining me and uh, another project director for a month based out of Red Lodge, and we're working on collecting different fossils from the area and answering questions similar to the one that I'm going to talk about today um, on different groups. So if you have questions about our field work, we can answer that or talk to you about those later. Again, students, raise your hands. So you can find the students or me um, to ask questions about, put them on the spot. Um, but getting right into the talk, I'm going to talk about how a dinosaur like this, a big titanosaur, you might have seen the famous titanosaur at the big museum in New York, grew from about hatchling size, which would be about the size of a big dog, to the biggest animals that ever walked the earth. How long did it take? What was the pattern? Um, and just how special was that in the grand scheme of things? Dinosaurs capture our imagination in the public, and also they capture scientists' imagination and interest because they're the largest animals that ever walked on land. And they're not the largest animals that ever walked on land by like a little bit. <laughs> they didn't just beat all the other animals, they're the largest by a large margin. So here you can see the largest mammals alive today, the elephant and the giraffe. This is the largest fossil mammal, which wasn't much bigger in linear dimensions than them, it was just a lot heavier. And then the largest duck-billed dinosaur and horned dinosaur, T-Rex would have been about the size of this animal. But the biggest uh, dinosaurs were way bigger than that. And from what we know about evolution, we know that even complex features such as eyes, wings, the ability to have live birth, um, living in the water versus on the land, all those things have evolved repeatedly over time. And we call that convergent evolution. But these dinosaurs got bigger than anything else by a large margin, and that makes them very special. And a lot of my research into them has focused on why they've broken through some sort of other constraint that other animals, either mammals or other reptiles, have had. Um, I want to start the talk just getting everyone on the same page about a couple things. So let's start with a quiz, so the students will love this. Take uh, one minute and talk to your neighbor, and I want to pose this question to you, these two questions to you. How many species of dinosaur are currently named? and how often is a new dinosaur species discovered? So take a minute, talk amongst yourselves.
Okay, so as you're discussing this, I'm, we should be on the same page about what a dinosaur is. So I just mean, <laughs> just mean reptiles that gave rise to birds. So things like Triceratops, Stegosaurus, T-Rex, Brachiosaurus, Brontosaurus, not mammoths, not fish, not snakes, not lizards, just Dinosauria, the group. So how many of those do you think there are? Do any, do any non-students have a guess? Not mammal-like reptiles even, just dinosaurs, yeah. Not even just archosaurs, so not crocodiles or their relatives, just being very specific, yeah. Okay, in the back. You got a thousand, who else? Another guess? <laughs> if 300? Richard has well over a thousand, Grant? There's 10,000 birds. Okay, so we would have to subtract those out. So actually, whoever said close to 1,000, that's about the count. That's great. First guess. <laughs> Nailed it. Um, about how often is a new dinosaur species discovered on average? Monthly. Monthly. We have a guess for monthly. Once a year. Once a year. Every three years. Every three years. Five years. Five years. We're getting longer and longer. So it's actually every few weeks or every couple of weeks. Oh. Um, in 2018, I tallied it up and it was around three per month that were announced. So um, that means that on average, if we did it on a yearly count, it would be um, every few weeks. That makes my job as a paleontologist right now really exciting. We're really in a golden age of discovery, but also really difficult because um, as my colleague and I were just talking about, you can do this big scientific project and have all your data and get ready to publish your findings and then there's like three other new discoveries you didn't know about from India, China, and Antarctica that are going to change the picture. So it's a really dramatically changing field and it's an exciting time, um, if not a chaotic time, to be a paleontologist. Uh, to see where dinosaurs live, this is a really nice publicly accessible, publicly federally funded database called the Paleobiology Database. You can go on this later. I put the uh, website right there. This is a plot of just dinosaur localities around the world. And you can see I've color coded them by their age throughout the Mesozoic era for the Triassic in purple the Jurassic in blue, and the Cretaceous in green. And what you see is that dinosaurs were abundant and common everywhere. Um, we have them in Australia, in New Zealand, in Antarctica. Um, the dots missing, but there's some from the north slope of Alaska, Siberia, all throughout Europe, um, and definitely all throughout the US and uh, in South America. So they're abundant, they're common, they're diverse. Again, these are localities. These are just dots on the map. So Probably one of these dots is like west of Cody, and you could have hundreds or thousands of specimens um, in that given area. So we're really talking about hundreds of thousands to millions of dinosaur bones worldwide throughout you know, well over 150 million years, a really abundant, diverse record. If I was giving this talk 40 years ago, there would be like a tenth of these dots on the map. So it's really dramatically um, being explored and it's a big changing picture. Uh, this is a nice family tree of dinosaurs. Um, some of the branches get shifted around by more recent studies, but this is your basic backbone. So you've got uh, horned dinosaurs as the sister group to uh, the dome-headed dinosaurs. They're closely related to the duck-billed dinosaurs and then the armored ones like Stegosaurus and Ankylosaurus. Those are all called ornithischians, or the bird-hipped dinosaurs. On the other end of things, we have the long-necked dinosaurs and their ancestors, so prosauropods and sauropods. These are the ones I mentioned earlier that are the biggest that ever walked on land. And then we have the branch that uh, gave rise to birds, the theropods. So probably the most famous ones, things like Spinosaurus, T-Rex, Velociraptor, those all fit in there. And then this last branch here um, with birds, that contains the 10,000 birds that we have alive with us today. Uh, so this is our backbone family tree, and we're going to come back to this throughout the talk. 
um, and figuring out how this diverse group uh, got, uh, got its large size. So now that we're all a little more on the same page of how many dinosaurs there are, where they're found, and how they're related, I'll go into a little bit more about how they grew up, how fast, and what patterns, and the evidence for that. And I'm going to start the story uh, focusing on this titanosaur here, which um, the one that we're studying is from Madagascar, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. It didn't grow to the biggest proportions. It maybe was 60 or 70 feet as an adult, but you can see just how tiny it was as a baby. And that's because, unlike mammals, all dinosaurs were constrained to lay eggs, which puts a lot more growing in their path than a mammal would have. If you look at a large whale or an elephant, a bison, uh, large mammals today, their young are going to be a relatively large body mass relative to their adult, so maybe a fifth or a sixth of that adult size. If you look at a dinosaur, we're looking at an egg here that's not much bigger than a volleyball, maybe at max volume, that has to grow into something that's over 100 feet long. So rather than increasing your body mass six-fold, you have to increase it over a hundred-fold. And that's exceptional, that's unprecedented um, among animals today. And so that's another superlative we can assign to dinosaurs. And it means that they just had a lot more growing to do, and they might have had different patterns and rates relative to um, animals today. So just to drive the point home again, if we have a famous T-Rex adult grown here. This is about the size of what it would be if it hatched from an egg. So the largest dinosaur eggs by volume are actually not as voluminous as the largest bird eggs. So ostriches um, and other ratites, other flightless birds, their extinct relatives had bigger eggs than the biggest dinosaurs did. And the biggest dinosaurs did not have the biggest eggs even within that group. So um, a lot of growing to do. In paleontology, we like to compare things quantitatively with modern animals to put things in a framework. So we can start with the question of how long did it take T. rex to reach its adult body mass and body size? And we can compare that to reptiles like this crocodile. That might take a couple decades or three or four decades, depending on the species, to reach about a ton or 2,000 pounds. Uh, bison, like we have around here, that can do that in just a few years, so a much faster growth rate to put on those pounds. And then flightless birds, they don't reach those sizes today, but if they did, they do it very quickly. So even an ostrich um, is growing up even in just a year or two. So the fastest growth rates of all are in the birds. So where does uh, T. rex and its kin where, where does it fall on that spectrum of growth rates? T-Rex weighs something like seven or 8,000 kilograms, so uh, you know, 15,000 pounds. If it grew at crocodile-like rates, then this animal would have to be over a century old to be that, that big. If it grew at mammalian rates, maybe it could do it in a couple of decades. And if it grew like bird-like rates, then which these are the closest relatives, so you might think that they have the most similar rates, it could probably do that within a decade. So how old is a big T-Rex? So like I said, I'm going to start by talking about this titanosaur from Madagascar. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of a team to go dig in Madagascar in 2015, and we found lots of these baby sauropods, these baby long-necked dinosaurs. Um, I'm not going to talk about one that I particularly found because that's still um, in a lab like you have here. It's in, down at the Denver Museum being studied and prepared, all those different individuals. But we had one from a previous field season and we got really curious about how fast it grew, how old it was when it died. Because you can see we have a lot of different bones from around the, around the body. So most of the forelimb and the hilum, part of the pelvis, and then part of the vertebral column. And when this individual died, it would have stood you know, below your knee, a very small individual. You can see him depicted right there, as opposed to the adult of the same species. 
So we wanted to ask the question, how old was this when it died? Again, was it, if this was growing at the rates that a turtle grew, maybe this was 10 years old or 15 years old. If this is growing at the rates that a bird grew, maybe it's like a week old, uh, and a mammal, something in between. Um, here's just some pictures of us in Madagascar. You can see my, myself there, my co-project director, Simona. She's in the audience. Um, and you can ask her questions too at the end. But fossils are extremely abundant and extremely well preserved in Madagascar. Um, I'm sure many of you have gone hiking around here and come across deer and elk and cow and horse bones, antelope. Um, the bones almost look just like that in Madagascar, even though they're 65 million years old. And they're almost as easy to dig out of the ground as they are. So really exceptional. You can see us working with a team of Malagasy students and professors, some local shepherds coming to visit us in our quarry, see what we're doing. Um, but we just had a treasure trove of bones right here in northwest Madagascar, just off the coast of Africa. The way that we look at how fast an animal grew is generally through a technique or a field called bone histology. So bone histology, histology is the study of tissues if you go get a biopsy of something, um, it's a histologist who's looking at that. Uh, it's the level of organization between cellular biology, so looking at the cells of your body, and then organ level physiology. So between like a cell biologist and a cardiologist, somebody who studied the tissue of the heart would be a heart histologist. Um, I'm a bone histologist because hearts aren't preserved in the fossil record. So we can study bones and teeth, hard tissue, that are fossilized to look at uh, aspects of um, biology in the past. And here are four examples of the femur, or thigh bone, under relatively low magnification, actually. So this is almost a whole cross section. You can see I have a little um, cartoon here of a crocodile's thigh bone, or femur. You can see a tiny marrow cavity in the middle you can see there's these rings arranged around and then some dots scattered throughout. Here you can see a more zoomed in version of a turtle's thigh bone or femur. You can see there's only one of these dots, right? We have many of the dots scattered throughout here, but only one on the turtle. And then really fine, dense lines traveling around. Here's a duck. You can see the duck has not just circles, but it actually has circles and also tubes. So it looks like there's a network of those black lines, like a spider web, interwoven throughout there. And then here in this elk, you can see something intermediate, where we do have a lot of these dots, these tubes. We have one of these big lines, like we see in the turtle. And, um, and we have still other black tubes. The dots and the tubes, so that circle, that's gonna hold the blood vessels that nourish the bone. So your bone is a living tissue. You might have heard the old adage that you get a new skeleton every seven years. That's not actually that off to a first approximation. So your body is continually resorbing, like actually dissolving your bone on a microscopic scale with acid, and then replenishing it with new bone. When that process breaks down, you get osteoporosis where you have too much dissolution and not enough deposition. So this living tissue has to have blood vessels running throughout it. And you can see that the slow-growing animals have few blood vessels, just one in this very slow-growing tortoise, a few in this crocodile, more in this mammal, and then just like a crazy network in this duck, the fastest-growing animal on this screen. Even smaller dots, you can see kind of look like um, a polka dot pattern or peppered throughout here. The very small dots that are black here, white here, those are holding living cells within the bone. So your bone and the bones of these animals have little cells that act like um, little sensors for pressure uh, that detect if your bone is under too much strain. And let's say that this elk jumps over a fence and it kind of comes down too hard and on its front leg here, a little crack develops, just um, a quarter inch crack. Well, those cells are gonna, 
be disrupted. They're going to be cut off from their nourishment. They're going to send signals through these blood vessels back to the endocrine system, and that's going to tell your body to fix that crack, dissolve all the bone around there, and lay down new bone. And the more cells and the more blood vessels you have, the more metabolically active you are. Right? The faster you can grow, the more warm-blooded you are, gen very generally speaking, um, and the easier it is to replace your bone. So we have these um, hard tissue records in the past, and luckily, they're very well, they're very readily fossilizable. So I don't know of almost any examples, it's probably 1% of fossils, if you cut them up and look under a microscope, that they don't have these features preserved. So this is a Brachiosaurus bone. Uh, it's 150 million years old, and we can see that there's a big canal here. We've zoomed way in, a canal for a blood vessel, and then we can see these little cavities that once held cells. There's no soft tissue in here. There's no cell. There's actually rust or hematite that's infilling parts of this. But we have perfect casts to the submicron, so below a thousandth of a millimeter level, that tell us the size, shape, orientation, and density of these cells, as well as the blood vessels that surround them. We can look at that not just by destroying a fossil and looking at it under a microscope, but today we have techniques like CT scanners. We have much more powerful ones than these that can look at much higher resolution. So for example, we looked at the shin bone of that baby titanosaur that I showed you earlier, and this is a single cross section of that shin bone, and you can see it's just full of those holes. Right? Those are the holes that would have once held uh, blood vessels in life. So this looks a lot more like that duck than it did like that turtle, right? Except for one kind of mysterious band. Can everyone see that running around there? I can highlight it for you briefly. There's one denser band. And we can see in that band that um, there weren't as many blood vessels, suggesting that growth was slower in that interval. And when we use our CAT scanner to scan all the bones, so the thigh bone, the inner and outer shin bones, uh, the upper arm bone, the fingers, the toes, we see that same ring throughout, indicated with arrows here. So a slightly denser area in every single bone that uh, indicates fewer blood vessels, so a slower metabolic rate locally at that time. And just highlighting that for you, under the microscope, you can see again that the canals that held the blood vessels, so the little capillaries in that area, are thinner. They are smaller. And so we wanted to know what this meant, so we compared it again to more modern animals. This is what that tissue looks like here. And which ones do you think it looks most like? Which one or ones? Any students? The duck, right? It's got all these big open spaces. It's just loaded with the cavities that once held cells, right? They're overlapping each other in most places. So it looks kind of like the duck, kind of like the mammal, but it doesn't look anything like the tortoise, and it doesn't really look like the crocodile either. So we can actually Exper or it has been done that each of these types of animals and many more species have been experimentally raised and that way we know their exact age. Once the animals die, you cut up their bones and you measure the rate of tissue growth based on the density of the blood vessels supplying them. And you can actually quantify this to know that, for example, this might have grown a few millimeters a year. This could have grown a few centimeters a year, right? This could have grown its whole thickness within a few months, um, and that's something intermediate. So the density and the spacing of the cells in the blood vessels allows us to pretty readily extrapolate how fast these individuals grew. And so for our baby titanosaur, 
we know that between this dense line, which we infer is a hatching line, which is, um, which is seen in many animals today, and the end of the bone, we know that that deposition took place in about six to 11 weeks. So pretty rapid. We know that it hatched at about eight pounds based on the size of the ring where it hatched. So imagine an animal hatching, it's under great metabolic stress, it has to make its life in the world for the first time without a ready supply of food, and so growth temporarily stops as that adjustment happens, and this happens in a lot of animals today. So from that growth line till there, we can estimate that this animal was just a couple months old when it died. And that suggests really rapid growth on the order of a mammal or even a bird. And that suggests that these were act metabolically active, more on the warm-blooded, to really use broad stroke terms uh, of the spectrum, than the cold-blooded side. What about learning about dinosaurs after their first year of growth? So this animal died in just the first couple of um, months of growth. We can use a different feature called lines of arrested growth, or lags. If we take a full cross-section of a leg bone or an arm bone, whichever bone you want, this is a shin bone of this creature called Majungasaurus from Madagascar. You can see, if you squint and don't look at the cracks, these nice concentric lines wrapping around the bone. And those lines are getting farther apart and then closer together. Those lines are annual in nature. They're analogous to tree rings today. This has been demonstrated in um, mammals today, reptiles, fish, that these lines form in the season of resource limitation. So either the dry season, the winter, the cold season, the season where an animal doesn't have as much um, resources to grow, it will slow down growth, deposit one of these lines, and then pick it up again in the spring. So each of these bands probably represents probably five to nine months, and then each of these lines a few months of itself, of cessation of growth. So that's really fortunate that we can use this, these annual lines, which again have been, they're so readily deposited, they're, they're used in um, wildlife management, so if any of you are familiar with taking toe clippings or cutting antlers or things like that, these are readily deposited annually um, throughout the animal kingdom. And so we can assume, based on similarity to today, that these are annual lines in dinosaurs. And what's nice is that that allows us to just tally up the age of an individual based on the number of rings inside of it. It gets a little tricky because we have an ever-expanding marrow cavity, MC, here. But as long as we find enough juveniles and adults, we can kind of retro-calculate or back-calculate um, how many rings are lost. So you can take a uh, Tyrannosaurus leg, cut it in half, uh, look at it under the microscope, polished, and just count up the rings and see how many lines are there. And that's the minimum age of that individual. Some bones, like some bones of the shin, don't have as thick of, uh, as wide of a marrow cavity. So for example, this is an actual uh, Tyrannosaurus shin bone. And you can see, we started at 12 here, but you can tick off and count the different lines. And so this T-Rex would have been at least 19 years old. And we can see that the remaining five or six growth lines on the outside are extremely close together indicating that this individual was done growing as it died. Again, we have more updated techniques than just destroying bones and looking at them under a microscope. We can use CAT scanners again, but on a bigger scale. So this is a big carnivorous dinosaur shin bone, and we can look at it in a CAT scanner. You can, it's a little fuzzy, but you can see the rings in the bone here, represented as vertical lines here or here. And we can actually then reconstruct growth in the middle or oldest part of the bone in 3D through time. So digitally, we can trace those rings and see how, how thick each layer was and if the bone changed shape in any way throughout time. 
Right? So here we would say that the bone was more circular in a juvenile, and then it became more oval or even subtriangular in an adult. Now, how does this tell us anything besides the number of years that the animal grew? So this animal was minimum of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, whatever was lost in the marrow cavity. But the thickness of the line tells you how fast the animal was growing at that time. And this is also used, this is again analogous with tree rings. The thicker the line, the more mass was put on that year. The reason that that works so well, or that we can put numbers on it, is that the circumference or the area around a ring is proportional to the mass of that animal at that time. And this is consistent across amphibians, reptiles, and mammals, everything today that walks on four legs. So we can go out and measure a bunch of body masses at zoos, measure the dimensions of their thigh bone and their upper arm bone, and see that there's a one-to-one -one, uh, or a tight correlation between the thickness of the band and how much weight it supported. And architecturally, that should make sense, or from an engineering standpoint, because the cross-sectional area of a column is proportional to how much weight it holds. And that's nice because then we can, re uh, we can calculate or create these growth curves so we'll have a bunch of curves shown through the rest of the talk with age on the x-axis going across here, so from young to old, and then size or body mass on the y-axis, so going from small to big. And all we have to do is plot up our known age versus our size or mass, and we usually get a curve that looks something like this. This is, for example, what a human growth curve would look like, right? We're born. We don't grow too much, we don't grow too much, we don't grow too much, and then we hit puberty. We rock it, get to about our adult size, maybe you're like 17 here, and then you taper off, and no more growth. This is the way most animals grow. Maybe the S curve is straighter or more abrupt, but mostly these S-shaped growth curves. And then we can fit mathematical models through there, and from that, we can describe parameters like the maximum growth rate, so how fast the animal grew during its growth spurt. And that's interesting to compare among different animals. We can also trace this through evolution, so we can see increases in growth rate. So species B evolved a faster maximum growth rate than species A, or maybe species C evolved a slower growth rate than species A, and we can compare these through time to and across that um, family tree that I showed you to see how growth evolved through time. So here's some results from some other paleontologists um, that really helped to establish these methods about 10 or 15 years ago, looking at Tyrannosaurus and its close relatives. So you can see the T-Rex growth curve it's actually not too dissimilar from ours, where we have slow, 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 slow growth, a puberty, and then an offset at about age 20. Of course, the scale is a lot different, right? So we're only getting to um, maybe 50 or 100 kilograms, whereas T-Rex is getting up to six or 7,000 kilograms. And we can also see in terms of evolution that the ancestors of T-Rex, which is one of these three, we're not sure which, the ancestors would have grown much uh, on the same time scale. So again, slow, slow, slow growth, accelerating, and then tapering, but at a much lower rate. So in other words, T-Rex evolved its growth rate through acceleration of its ancestral growth rates. Other dinosaurs did this differently. So this is that same one, Majungasaurus, that I showed you. It got to a pretty modest adult body mass, under 1,000 kilograms, so this thing weighed less than a big bison. But it did that, and it took 25 or 30 years. Really slow growth, slower than, than a crocodile for this pretty cro close relative of T-Rex. And here on a broken cross-section of one of its shin bones, you can see I've highlighted these really closely spaced growth lines. And you can see it only put on like a millimeter of bone each year in each place. 
Other dinosaurs uh, had more typical S-shaped growth curves. So here's a well-known one called Truodon, much smaller, only got to be about the mass of a human, and that would have taken about 10 to 15 years. Or here, a duck-billed dinosaur that had a much straighter growth curve, Myasaura. It would have rocketed right out the gate, grown really, really fast, and then started to taper around age 8 to 12 at about 3,000 kilograms. Those sauropods were the, that were the biggest of the big, the long-necked dinosaurs like this species here, they would have gotten to masses two to three times those of T. rex, but that would have taken longer, so taking about um, three or four decades to get to that adult mass. Other ones like this funny beaked one here, they actually found one that had the pigment of the skin preserved, so we know it had um, a light belly and a dark back and spots on its arms. That one um, would have gotten to a more modest body mass in about a decade. So the point that I wanted to drive home is that as far as we've seen today, or as far as we know today, the different groups that have been studied grew at all different rates and to some extent to different patterns, right? So some like the tyrannosaurs, just going back, having a really slow time until they onset that growth like humans do today, to some others that would just have linear fast growth out the gate until uh, they taper off. And I think that reflects how diverse this group is. Only the, the groups in, um, highlighted in blue have actually been studied in any detailed way in terms of their growth. So you can see, especially for the students out here, there is a ton more to do and a ton more to learn in terms of the evolution of this group. This field is pretty new um, and we're trying to keep up with new discoveries but the diverse body shapes, body sizes, and ecologies and diets, all these dinosaurs are very different. And so there isn't one way to grow up as a dinosaur. Some of the smaller ones took uh, decades. Some of the bigger ones took a decade. There's a huge range of variation in how these animals grew. And there's no one way to grow up as a dinosaur. Um, so with that, I wanted to thank one of my former students who did a lot of this work with me. Uh, my current collaborators and some funding on the project. Uh, all of you for coming out on a Wednesday night and you for your attention. And I think we're right at six, so we can take some questions. <laughs>